My name is Hyman McPherson. I'm director of the Urban Ecology Lab and chair of the Environmental Studies Program here at the New School. And I'm very delighted to welcome you to our event today, the Resilient Cities Livable Futures event, which is a kickoff to a week-long discussion that we're having among 100 researchers and practitioners from 10 US and uh, Latin cities. So today's day-long program, we're going to be discussing the challenges, the progress, and opportunities for building urban resilience to climate-driven extreme events in these uh, 10 cities in particular, but also as a way to galvanize the kinds of opportunities um, and advanced research for other cities that are, of course, facing similar challenges. So I'm excited to welcome some of the New Yorkers uh, here, but I'm also delighted that the New York audience is joined by this group of, as I mentioned, 100 different researchers and practitioners from the different cities, and I'll go through them in just a minute, all of whom have flown in uh, today to be here with us, but also for this um, intensive long week of workshops where we're going to try to dig much more deeply uh, into the social, ecological, and infrastructural resilience building research that's needed to underpin and advance resilience building efforts across these cities. This program is presented by the uh, U.S. National Science Foundation. Uh, that's some fundamental funding support for the Urban Resilience to Weather Related Extreme Events Project. This project is a sustainability research network that the National Science Foundation has funded, and that's where this group of researchers and um, other leaders from the different cities have come from. We're also supported by the Urban Ecology Lab, the Environmental Studies, Global Studies, and Urban Studies Program by the Tishman Environment and Design Center, all here at the New School, uh, as well as local partners at NYU, at CUNY, uh, and by our colleagues at Arizona State University. I wanted to mention that we are live streaming this event and recording this event, so you'll notice uh, some cameras. This morning will be a series of presentations and panel discussion. The afternoon will be a bit more lively with uh, a lot more people on stage and even moving around as we sort of dig into the issues in terms of um, how they work across the different cities. Also notice if you want to tweet, the hashtag is up here on the right at urexahm 17 And for those of you from the more general public, that stands for the Urban Resilience to Extremes Project. And this is, uh, as I mentioned for this week, our all hands meeting you're trying to understand what that acronym is about. So our agenda for the day will be first a series of short introductions and framing for the day. Then during the morning, we'll focus on climate resilience building efforts here in New York City. In the afternoon, after a lunch break, we'll be discussing these challenges, the progress and opportunities in many ways that are similar perhaps, but also unique in the 10 cities in our network. The cities include Syracuse, New York, Baltimore, Miami, Portland, Oregon, Phoenix, Hermosillo, Mexico, Valdivia, Chile, Mexico City, San Juan, Puerto Rico, as well as New York City. Now, to get us started, I'd like to introduce first Michelle DePass, who will welcome you to the New School and help situate why we're hosting this event here and the commitment we have to resilience and sustainability in all we do. I'm going to give, say a few words about you, Michelle, before I have you come up, if you don't mind. Michelle is the Dean of the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy, and also the Tishman Professor of Environmental Policy and Management here at the New School. She joined the Milano School in November 2013, coming from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency here in the US at the federal level, where since 2009, she had served as administ Assistant Administrator for International and Tribal Affairs. This was a presidential appointment, a Senate confirmed position, and Michelle's been responsible then for all the dimensions of environmental policy between EPA and other nations, and federally recognized tribal nations and multilateral institutions and donors. The other thing I should mention is that prior to joining the EPA, uh, Michelle was program officer at the Ford Foundation, where she managed a portfolio on environmental and community development, most notably green economy and climate change, and environmental health and justice and indigenous environmental rights. So, in before I bring her up, I'll just say in her two-decade career in sustainability and public service, Michelle has done amazing work, including um, here in New York before that, the EPA stint, as founding executive director of the New York Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, and many other things. We're delighted to have uh, Michelle here to welcome us. Thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everybody. 
For those of you visiting us from warmer climates, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, if you're here the whole week, I promise it might get a little warmer, so stay tuned. So welcome to the new school. And I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, I really want to thank you for joining us from wherever you've come, from near or far, for the whole week of workshops to follow. A really special thank you to Timon McPherson, who is a colleague and you know, chair of the Environmental Studies Program and also director of the Urban Ecology Lab, who's worked so hard to bring this whole week together. Though, together. So thank you, Timon. So you've traveled here from other states, from other countries, and welcome to New York. But I think it's really important for you to have some understanding, if you don't know much about the New School, is that you've come to the perfect place to be discussing one of the most significant issues of our era. The New School, although the name is the New School, was actually founded almost 100 years ago. And really, it was founded by prominent intellectuals and educators who sought to challenge the intellectual and artistic status quo by creating a school where faculty and students would be free to honestly and directly address the problems facing societies in the 20th century. For almost 100 years, the New School has evolved continuously in response to changes in the marketplace of ideas, career opportunities, and human curiosity. So today, with, along with expertise in fields of design, social research, management, and liberal and performing arts, our commitment to sustainability is one of the defining features of the university. The New School's Tishman Environment and Design Center is a university-wide research and practice center that fosters this integration of bold policy, design, and social justice approaches to the environmental issues that will advance a just and sustainable outcome in collaboration with communities. We collaborate with scholars, practitioners, students, activists, and organizations across this university and in communities on projects and research focused on critical environmental issues, including climate change and environmental justice. On campus, the Tishman Center serves as a hub for sustainability initiatives and works in collaboration with other departments to, to create a university-wide culture of sustainability. The Tishman Center is currently working with university leadership and faculty and students on an initiative to embed sustainability learning outcomes into the curriculum for all new school students, undergraduate and graduate. In creative new ways, we will be able to contextualize with a student's chosen field of study and emphasize a just and equity-based understanding of sustainability. We collaborate with our fantastic buildings and facilities department to engage and inform students, faculty, staff, and visitors alike about the sustainability of our campus infrastructure. This building, the University Center, is LEED Gold certified, incorporating features like cogeneration of heat and electricity, on-site water treatment, and a green roof. In other buildings on campus, there are continuous improvements being made to increase the efficiency of our building systems and keep new school on pace to become carbon neutral by 2040. True to the university's founding principles, we're also outward looking in our approach to sustainability. In 2015, the New School became the second largest university in the United States to divest from all fossil fuels. We also support faculty research and their commitment to real world issues in collaboration with grassroots and community organizations. Examples of this include an ongoing community-based study of air quality in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, led by Professor Ivan Ramirez in collaboration with El Puente, a community human rights institution that, that promotes leadership for peace and justice through the engagement of members, youth and adults, in the arts, education, scientific research, wellness, and environmental action. With support from the Tishman Center, professors such as Barrett Roth and Stephen Metz are developing technology and mobile apps to remove plastics from our waterways and map environmental threats from proposed fossil fuel infrastructure like pipelines. And music professor Tanya Kalmanovich is composing a tar sand songbook that uses pipelines as a literal and figurative means of connecting music to oil by blending ethnography and musical practice. At the end of this week, on March 25th, 
the NSF Urban Resilience Project and the Urban Ecology Lab at the New School, led by Professor Tyman McPherson, will host Visiting, Visiting Climate Justice in Harlem, a workshop together with WE Act and other local partners at the Manhattan Borough President's Office. So we're proud to be a part of this collaborative, community-based world here that we like at the New School. And I look forward to hearing about similar projects you all may be conducting in other cities across the US and Latin America. In the face of ever-increasing impacts of climate change, resilience is crucial. And justice and equity are critical to that equation. I'm sure this will be a recurring theme for this week. And my hope for this conference is that conversations we have will empower us to take all the ideas shared here and turn them into concrete and successful actions at home. We are the change we seek. The cities represented by the Urban Resilience to Extremes Sustainability Research Network are collectively home to 45 million people. That's 45 million people whose health, lives, and well-being stand to be threatened by a myriad of issues ranging from extreme heat to coastal flooding and storm surges. That's also 45 million people whose lives, health, and well-being can flourish if we're successful in our efforts to make our cities more equitable and resilient. I look forward to hearing about the research being conducted here and the efforts that are already underway to create a sustainable living and future. And thank you for your contributions to this goal. And again, thank you for coming to the New School. Have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And I forgot to put up your title slide, see? This morning will feel a bit formal because we're having these series of presentations, but um, trust me, this afternoon we're going to mix it up and make it much more conversational. And even before then, uh, we'll be inviting our uh, initial presenters in a panel discussion. So a couple things I wanted to mention about that, and I'll remind you right before the break, is um, to get a note card and, and take some notes from the presentations coming up. And especially in terms of questions you might like to ask, we will have some time for questions from the audience. And the way we'll manage that is to have you um, hand in those note cards during the break before the panel comes up. So I'll remind you of that again. Um, I want to take a few moments to frame the discussion for the day. And as Michelle had said, for those of you from out of town, welcome to New York City. New York City is an interesting place, and of those 45 million people in our research network, eight and a half million of them live here, and that number is climbing. It's the most dense and diverse city in the United States, one of the most diverse cities in the world. There are over a million buildings in the city. There's over two million other, uh, other built features, including those buildings, with an incredibly rich array of natural areas. And in these one million buildings, there are people, uh, eight and a half million people right now. Here you're looking at Manhattan, and this infrastructural and ecological richness is matched by the social diversity. By some accounts, over 700 languages are spoken here, more than any other location in the world, which means we have an incredibly rich cultural, ethnic, and racial diversity. When faced with challenges such as Hurricane Sandy and other threats by climate change, the social, ecological, and infrastructural complexity of our city makes it important to apply the best science and knowledge to climate resilience planning and policy. Flooding challenges have the potential to be severe, as we've already experienced. We've, done the, we've experienced these many times in our history. In fact, it wasn't just Hurricane Sandy, but if you look back historically, there's been a number of places where these buildings and these people have been significantly flooded time and time again. In fact, the spatial variation and impacts of climate change means that, as Michelle was discussing, equity and justice concerns have to be at the top of the priority list when making plans to protect New Yorkers from climate threats. To prepare for the next major coastal flood, we've got considerable progress. We've made considerable progress, but we have much left to do, and I think that's some of what we want to talk about today. Similar to flooding, when you consider the challenge of rising heat and heat waves, it's clear we have still here much left to do. The New York City Panel on Climate Change predicts a tripling of heat waves by 2080, if not before. In fact, last year, uh, we had a number of, of heat waves that threatened the city. Impacts of heat and heat extremes 
are perhaps even more unjust when you look across the city. When you look at areas that have low density of green space, high density of paved surfaces, combined with low income and elderly communities, you can start to understand the drivers of these heat impacts, including the health impacts of heat, all of which demonstrate the kind of urban system science we're trying to employ in our project to better understand these drivers, but also to see where the opportunity lies for solutions from neighborhood to city to regional scales. By mapping and visualizing and linking some of the drivers of vulnerability to heat and other climate challenges, we're starting to understand where these opportunities for building resilience to heat and other uh, climate-driven challenges are. For example, when you look here at the temperature data, we will also be able to see that this overlaps very strongly with where our elderly populations, our low-income populations are. Here you can see uh, just in the buildings and the people living in those buildings, the median income from low to high for the city. And you can see that there's high spatial variability here, very uh, high income people as you move south in Manhattan. We were just looking at the north in the Harlem and northern Manhattan area. As we move south along Central Park, you can see the income going up dramatically. This variability is something on the one hand that we as New Yorkers know and are sort of used to experiencing. On the other, it creates significant challenges for thinking about how we understand both the income uh, variability and ability to respond because of uh, lack of resources, as well as some of the most affected people. Here we're looking at the examples of uh, elderly folks living in the city that are often the most challenged by heat extremes. Of course, the challenges are not just environmental, but they're also economic, they're infrastructural, and more. When we think about planning and making decisions for the future, we also have to be thinking about not just where we are now with eight and a half million people, but where we're headed in the future. We're going to be looking at how populations rise uh, as part of this project, understanding how density changes over the course of this project, understanding a number of uh, some of the challenges that people are going to be facing when they're trying to deal with, with climate. And I think one of the most important aspects that we want to discuss today is not just the vulnerability uh, and, and why people are vulnerable in particular areas in the city, why we need to focus on particular areas in the city, but also where and how the infrastructure is vulnerable, where and how the nature that we depend on for so many of the climate adaptation potential that we have, how it's vulnerable as well. So in short, uh, we're going to need new partnerships, the best science, and knowledge from no local communities to help us uh, understand these and ex understand the impacts of climate change and plan solutions to them in a way that we can hopefully have more resilient cities, not just in New York City, but across our network, uh, and more livable futures that promote healthier and happier residents. So these issues, including the current climate challenges and the progress that are al already being made, are some of the things that we're going to get into. And I want to introduce our first speaker in just a moment. As I mentioned before, we're going to start with, and I'm, we're going to start with. Uh, talking a little bit about this project as a way to frame this. I'm going to invite up and uh, tell you a little bit about our two co-leads for the Urban Resilience to Weather Related Extremes project. Uh, that's Nancy Grimm and Chuck Redman. Nancy Grimm is co-director of the Urban Resilience to Weather Related Extremes Event Sustainability Research Network, which is a very long name, and it's why we've shortened it to URX. <laughs> and she studies the interaction of climate change, human activities, and ecosystems. It's worth noting, and one of the reasons that she's co-leading this project is from 1997 to 2016, she's led one of the only urban long-term ecological research sites in central Arizona and Phoenix called the CAP LTER, which has been a pioneering interdisciplinary study of the Phoenix metropolitan region. She currently co-directs this uh, network that we'll be working with today and for the rest of the week and is focused on these issues of urban resilience and climate change and extreme events in particular. It's worth noting that she was president and is a fellow of the Ecological Society of America and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, or the AAAS. She's also editor of a journal called Earth's Future, which I think fits very nicely with some of the discussions that we want to be having today, and is a past program director for the US National Science Foundation, 
senior scientist for the U.S. Global China Change Research Program, and also totally relevant to the discussions we're having today, lead author for two chapters of the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which was released in 2014. They're going to tag team an intro to uh, the day, an intro to this project. So I'll just briefly introduce Chuck as well. Chuck Redman is also co-director of this project. He was the director of the Center for Environmental Studies at Arizona State University. And uh, in 2004, was chosen as the Julianne Wrigley Director of the then newly formed Global Institute of Sustainability at Arizona State. From 2007 to 2010, Chuck directed ASU School of Sustainability. He's uh, currently working on building his research through the Institute of Sustainability there and through and teaching in the School of Sustainability, which is really focused on educating a new generation of leaders through collaborative learning, transdisciplinary approaches, and problem-oriented training to address uh, all the issues we're going to be talking about today, the environmental, the ecolo uh, ecological, and the social challenges um, of the coming century. So uh, Nancy and Chuck, if you'd come and introduce a little bit more about this project and uh, situate, I think, for the rest of our audience why we're here today. Thank you. Thank you, Timon, and thank you, Michelle, both for um, welcoming us, and um, thank you in particular for being such gracious hosts and uh, providing this um, facility and all the support staff and, and energy we know have gone into uh, preparing for a really wonderful week ahead. Um, Nancy and I are trying to, as we often do, tag team and, and discuss what the overview is, the big picture. Uh, and we were talking about it, and I was saying for me, and I hope for each of you, uh, this week, this event is all about getting to know each other personally and intellectually. In this modern age, a lot of our interaction goes on online. Uh, it goes on indirectly, and for a distributed network like this, there is no alternative, but there's huge value in seeing each other uh, and huge value in seeing the, the inclusiveness and diversity of the kind of things we're trying to tackle. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple. Nancy will dovetail with a couple more, but we're really interested here in making a difference. And we're interested in seeing how science can contribute uh, to the betterment of the world. If you're here, I think you already believe this is true and can be done, and we're hoping to build on that energy and, and enthusiasm for uh, making the cities of the world more resilient going forward. Uh, but there are barriers. Um, the reality is um, the world has been sort of successful doing what it does, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the things that it does, we may not like looking back at it. Uh, but it's not enough to say, uh, well, we're going to do different and we're going to build a resilient future city. Uh, our cities are the way they are because people have acted to make them that way. And it's going to take a really concerted and, more importantly, an insightful and collaborative approach to make cities different in the future. And so more than anything else, I'm hoping we're here to discover how we can really turn this battleship around because it will sail in the same direction uh, unless we really energetically address that. And once again, I'm preaching to the choir, uh, but cities is where it's going to happen. Uh, increasingly, people live in cities. Increasingly, cities direct the economic and social future of the world. Uh, and in many ways, and I'm sort of hopeful for this, cities are the political uh, centers of the world and will increasingly determine uh, what happens. And with that, climate change is one of the big issues facing us. And climate change uh, will affect cities directly. We probably will feel it here in cities. Uh, Superstorm Sandy will be one of the icons of discussion all week this week that many of you from the local area experienced firsthand, and those of us who weren't here have experienced it in many other ways, uh, both through media but also through visits and people we know. Uh, the other issue is that to make this difference, um, we, we think we, we have to understand and work with the world in a slightly different way than has been our tradition. Uh, and all of you who are part of the project understand 
our efforts to bring this together, this diversity conceptually as well as, as individually. Um, and we do think that this integrated approach uh, will have bear fruit and will make a difference. And part of that isn't just that we have ecologists, social scientists, engineers, and planners all at the table, but the people at the table are trying to understand why we see things differently. And Nancy will speak more to that because this is an important cornerstone of how we do, we hope to be doing our own studies and action plans. Uh, the other that I think is really important, and Michelle has already mentioned it, Ann Tymon, um, these issues could be solved, and we think climate change will be addressed by many people and many efforts, but we have to ensure that as we address one big problem, we don't create others. And the issues of equity and justice are often not f up front and center when we're talking about sustainability. We may be talking about energy and waste and materials, uh, but we also have to say, as we solve those problems, do we create others? And I have to admit that in, in building the world that we live in today, we've often sacrificed justice and access uh, in order to solve direct problems of supply and energy and things like that. And we, we hope in this project we're going to move beyond that. Let me turn this over to Nancy. Great. I uh, want to echo what everyone said. Welcome to everyone. It's really great to see everyone in person uh, instead of surrounded by a, a screen monitor. Um, so my message is, taking off from what Chuck was telling you, is I want you to think about why we're here. Why are we here in this place and why are we here together? And it has a lot to do with what I'm gonna call emergence. And if you're an ecologist, you might know what I'm talking about. Um, but I'll explain it a little bit. So when we think about diversity, we have in this project, we have the diversity of disciplines that we are trying to bring together to think about this, this issue of resilience against extreme events. We also have a diversity of, uh, of um, people, backgrounds, experiences. Uh, last year we had an all-hands meeting and we didn't have the early career scientists that are now uh, with us. And this is uh, a fantastic new thing for us to, to really exploit here. We also have diverse cities. These 10 cities, uh, time and mention to you, and if you're not familiar with the project, you might be scratching your head and saying, what do these cities have in common? They're really different. They're different sizes. Some of them are in Latin America, one in South America. Um, they have different problems. Some are coastal, some are inland. And that's exactly why this is a powerful potential uh, for us to explore these challenges of resilience with these very, very different cities. So why are we here? Well, every one of the cities is thinking about these issues in their own way, with their own approaches and their own projects. The city teams, this is the researchers from each city and the practitioners from those cities are working together, trying to build some, some new projects, some new ideas, some new approaches, trying to bring uh, the science uh, into what the city is doing. And that is hugely, hugely important part of this project. But why we're here is we now have the opportunity to bring those groups all together and to really think about what can emerge from putting these very, very different cities together and these very different perspectives together. What can emerge that's something that will help us to learn even more about um, how cities can respond to the challenges of climate change and uh, building resilience. So, um, I think what we want to be looking for here, my view, is we're looking for uh, the blending together of these very diverse perspectives. Remember that we are celebrating the fact that we are coming from very diverse perspectives in many, many respects, and see if we can get something really, truly useful to emerge from that. So thanks again for being here, and let's go.